Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of conversations with spiritually awakening people. We've done about 560 something of them now. Um, if this is new to you and you'd like to check out previous ones, please go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, and look under the past interviews menu. Um, this program is made possible by the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. So if you appreciate it and would like to help support it, there's a PayPal button on every page of the site. And we appreciate the support we receive. <clears throat> My guest today is Diana Durham. And I am going to let Diana introduce herself because the bio she sent me is kind of long. And, you know, I don't want to just read it when she can say it. Um, but um, I'll let her just do that, and then we'll get into an interesting conversation for the next couple of hours. So, Diana, go ahead. <laughs> Take it from there. Hi. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. Hi. Um, well, uh, I think it's long only because I've done a lot of sort of different things. I haven't had one sort of slightly, you know, I'm not particularly coherent in terms of my career path, I would say. Um, after university, I, I basically took the path less traveled. And I spent quite a lot of my 20s living in intentional spiritual community in England and in Canada and in the US. Um, is that a community anyone would have heard of or is kind um, of obscure? The Emissaries of Divine Light were the, the group and we had, we were quite small. Um, I ca and I came across this group quite by sort of my accident when I was eight, 18, when I, I'd i finished uh, high school and I came over to stay with my aunt and uncle, who I'd only recently discovered. They, they, were, they were, I don't want to do a huge detail, they weren't like blood re relatives, they were relatives through a, dis a marriage. And um, I thought they would be ordinary people living in Vancouver, you know, sort of nice suburban safe existence, and they could, they'd take care of me if I didn't want to go to this strange community that was up in the um, Caribou region of British Columbia. Uh, but when I, when I arrived literally at the airport, I wasn't met by them. I was met by someone else who told me that they lived up on this uh, community as well. And at that time it was the hippie time, you know, so I was used to the idea of hippie communes ex existing, but they w would always be filled with very young people, <laughs> young hippies. Um, and I didn't, you know, I considered these people to be old. And so I was very surprised that it had old people uh, in old this hippies. community. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, long story short, when I, when I, I stayed there for about six weeks during that a summer, and during that time, they'd have little sort of social gatherings and um, they'd have sort of, so you'd be invited over to someone's log cabin, have, have tea and cookies and conversation. It was very sweet and I, I was sitting there having tea with some of these people and I had this experience of, of transfiguration happen in me where uh, for no particular reason I mean I was just literally drinking tea and having conversation but I felt as if uh, this kind of golden sun was rising up in me and I, I felt so powerful and I, I, I felt so powerful that I got worried about it because I thought, well, what will happen when I go back to London? I, I'll take the city over. I'm so powerful. <laughs> seriously, that, I seriously felt that way. And I, I thought, oh, this is what love is. This is what that word means. And that's what, this is what the word truth means. And well, it, I and wonder I was, what was I, in that tea. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> and I, I, I sort of said this. To, it was herb tea. It was okay. like mint tea. <laughs> and I, I, I sort of said something like this to, to the people present and they just sort of tried they didn't see they didn't know what was going on with me and they just sort of tried to reassure me a little bit and then it it subsided but it, it left me realizing that um this energy is in all of us it's in everyone but none of most of the time we don't know it but if we did know it the world would be completely transformed and that was such an enormous insight you know i felt like i looked back into history at the misery, the suffering of all these people who'd never known who they really were. So I can't say that I lived from that moment, you know, it, 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 but that was like a benchmark that um, impa it, it impacted the way, you know, the direction that I, that I, that I took. Um, 
Now, I'd studied literature at university and I loved writers. I loved, I loved the beauty of language. And I suppose um, the, the two streams came together that I wanted to try to represent the authenticity of, of what we term the spiritual identity as well as I possibly could, as well as the great writers had done, you know, of other kinds of, of human experience. And so that's why I've mainly gone in it toward writing rather than, you know, activism or, or starting a movement or something like that. Um, <laughs> so anyway, after that, I, I, I had, so I had that experience and I came, I came back to university. In fact, so I, I did my degree after the, after that experience. Then I, it was after that, that I lived in the different communities. Um, and then I met my husband, um, and sort of began a, a life with him where we, we were, he, he's a TV director and I would work with him and I just, <laughs> and I had children and I just gradually began to, to write about what was important to me. Well, um, that experience was, I think, very significant because as you and I would both agree, um, you know, all the problems in the world are ultimately due to the fact that we have this tremendous potential within us that we're not using. And so we're, we're running around trying to solve all these problems and for the most part creating new ones <laughs> because we're only using a tiny fraction of our, our full potential. Yeah, I mean, that's a key point. And, and in the things that you write and say, that, that theme comes up again and again. And you became, um, you actually met David Bohm, didn't you? And, and um, worked with yes. him or studied with him uh, some? And, uh, yes, and that's right. Well, part of, um, part of this community at, in the, I think it was the early 80s, uh, there was something called the Human Unity Conference. Um, and this was an event that had been held in different parts of the world. And it it was held at Warwick University in England, and I we were part of a group that, that trying to help helping to organise this. And so I went to this conference, and the last evening, I think the sort of you know star spot, and I hadn't heard anything about this. One of my friends uh, gets up on stage, and here's this you know very um, academic and conservative looking uh, elderly g gentleman sitting on the stage next to him nothing like a hippie or anyone else um and my friend who was called he was called don factor started interviewing uh, david bohm it was david bohm and i was just oh my goodness it was electrifying i thought how did don meet this guy who is this guy where did he come from and i was very impressed actually with the way don was it was interviewing him because he he did a good job um and then that so that connection to david bohm led to a conference uh, just with him talking backwards and forwards and the idea, the, in a way, the practice and um, possibility of dialogue, which David Bohm was very interested in, deepened at that conference. Um, and uh, so then after that, I would go to dialogue circles that David Bohm was a part of. Mm. Um, now, but, now, many people, we should say who David Bohm is because yes, many yes, people may not even know. Yes, so, yes, of course. Go for it. Yes, well, David Bohm was a theoretical physicist um, and he, his field was quantum physics and um, he really was a star. Um, he, he was of uh, someone like, he was of Einstein's sort of stature. He, he was an amazingly brilliant man. However, and this is what I didn't, I didn't know this until much more recently. He had, he had been part of the team. He'd been asked to join Oppenheimer's team. Manhattan at Berkeley, Project. Yes, at the Manhattan Problem Project. And he came up with some theory about plasma, plasma in metals and the way it worked, which was useful to the project. His own research, and okay, so the other piece of this is a lot of intellectuals at that time in America, as we probably know, you know, were interested in communism, or they joined the Communist Party, or they went to communist lectures or something, and David Bohm uh, was one of those, because he was very idealistic all his life, and he was concerned with the problems of humankind, as well as with the, you know, mysteries of physics. And again, long story short, 
he became, I guess, the authorities became worried that so many of this Barclay group who were designing the, you know, the atom bomb were also uh, potentially <laughs> Marxists. <Right. laughs> and they thought this might be a breach of security, including Oppenheimer himself. He was also interested in these ideas, but he can't remember all the ins and outs, but he turned very mean. Anyway, later on, Oppenheimer, he basically sold uh, Bohm down the river. But anyway, Bohm was told to come and testify and he would not reveal his, he wouldn't rat on his friends. And he was, he was, he was brought up uh, before con some congressional hearing. McCarthy in hearings the, in the early yes, 50s, yes. yeah. But he wasn't, he wasn't imprisoned. And I, I can't remember now why. Um, but Princeton wouldn't let him back in. He was, the, he was, he had a job at Princeton at that time by then. And they wouldn't let him come back. Yeah. And he could not get a job. So he went off to Brazil, which is a relatively obscure place, really, for someone of his stature. Yeah, I just want to add that um, Bohm uh, wrote a paper, which um, only recently research has shown, um, you know, uh, was extremely important in terms of unifying general rel relativity, relativity with quantum mechanics. And Oppenheimer, for some reason, just stonewalled him and told all the people in the physics community not even to read the paper. And for some reason, they, all, they were also um, mm -hmm. lemming-like that they, they, they marched in step with what Oppenheimer ordered. And Bohm was like confused. Why, why isn't anybody commenting on this important paper? It's because no one had read it. So, you know... It, uh, the implications of that are, it, you know, we, a lot of people these days are distrustful of science and they think that science is, is um, not as objective as it purports to be. And there's truth in that. I mean, even the very <clears throat> the dominant paradigm uh, of science is materialism, which is that consciousness is produced by the brain and is not some fundamental reality. And if you stray from that, you threaten your career. Um, so that that sort of mindset continues in various forms, and I think I think that's a little significant diversion, maybe. Yeah, no, very much so. Um, yeah, so Dave, that was that something about David Bohm. Um, and also, who and Einstein incidentally said that you know he he considered Bohm his spiritual son, so he was very much uh, at, at a certain point in Einstein's uh, favor. Absolutely, yes. Okay, I interrupted you a couple times just to embellish those points. Well, yeah, so, I mean, so Bohm became also, he, he went to Bristol, and then from Bristol he went to Birkbeck College in London. And while he was in Bristol, he met um, uh, Krish Krishnamurti, Krishnamurti yeah. and he became very, very interested in the nature of thought itself and th thinking about thought, noticing what thought is doing. And then he became, and, and sort of, as a gr outgrowth or part of that, he became very interested in the process of dialogue, which was a sort of open, free form of uh, convers not not even really conversation, but a sort of form of conversation that if it went on long enough, you could start to hear the false voices in yourselves, in one another and oneself, the, the voice that's just got its little thing that it wants to keep saying, you know, my, my agenda, my particular rant about the world, you know, rather than being open to new meaning, right, and that you could get to a deeper place in the end if you if you start with it. Yeah, and so he and Krishnamurti had extensive dialogues, and at one point, Bohm asked some of his friends whether he should just give up physics altogether and spend all of yeah. his time talking to Krishnamurti. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah. he was a he was as much a I, I feel he he was as much a philosopher as a physicist, and well, that, that was his the great, great gift. physicist can't help but be exactly yeah, and his language was clear enough for lay people like ourselves to to sort of grasp what he's saying intuitively, even though I can't grasp it as a I'm not trained as a physicist, but you can grasp what he says intuitively. And I actually have a feeling that's really the only way we know anything anyway, at some fundamental level. Yeah. Some physicists get upset because spiritual types co-opt their, uh, their you know, theories and, and their findings without really fully understanding them as they do uh, in order to try to buttress some, some spiritual 
principle or some spiritual point. But I, I think yeah. they're, you know, and they're, they're, they may be right in doing that. I'm, I'm sure that, you know, armchair physicists leap to all kinds of erroneous conclusions. But at the same time, I think there is definitely some, some deep and profound connection there, which I think you and I are going to explore, um, which shouldn't be dismissed merely because we don't understand the mathematics. No, but it's a really good point. I, I, I did, you know, I've kind of pondered that in myself, because, but the way I've come to think about all of this is that there are different languages. You see, Bohm had a particular language, um, and some of it you can use. You know, you can, you, uh, poetry is a form of language. Um, symbolism is a form of language. Myth is a form of language. None of, the, none of them actually... They just represent a larger reality. They aren't that larger reality, but they represent it in quite useful ways so that one can think about it. But the important thing is to realize that you're, you're not actually dealing with the ultimate reality. You're, you're dealing with your own thought. And Bohm was very, very interested in that. He was very, he was very much aware that wh whatever scientific theory you, you got to, it, it was only a theory. Yeah. So in other words, um, we can only understand the deeper realities through theories and through experimentation, but we don't apprehend them directly. Is that what he was getting at? Well, I wouldn't want to say what he was getting at. Um, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I mean, I think partly, I think all he meant was no, no matter how, it, you know, advanced and complete a scientific theory might be it, it won't be the thing itself it's, you haven't yet ascertained the whole meaning and nature and structure of the universe right you, you you may have got an approximation to some of it so therefore you can't really be arrogant and you 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 you, you can never say that you know something for sure yeah, well, that's a good, I, th I think that's one of the beauties of the scientific method, which is that you never kind of can dig your heels in and claim absolute certainty. There's always a possibility that... Yeah, but what, people do, or they, or they sense or others. They do, you know, yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and therefore, as I forget who it was, Niels Bohr, somebody said that science progresses one funeral at a time. Yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> yeah. people don't easily change their their perspectives you know they have to die and let, <laughs> let people with new perspectives take well, over that's true, true about almost everything isn't it <laughs> but um Especially parents <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but this brings up an interesting point which is that um you know, why can't science really understand a thing for what it is? Why is it only a theory or a, a view or a partial perspective? And, you know, can yogis, can mystics actually know reality as it is through uh, a different approach, which may be scientific in its, in its methodology, but which is, uses very different apparatus, namely the human nervous system? Well, I mean, I, I think that... Um the only thing I can write about with any authority is what I call my own presence. Um, I know that. Now, you you could say, well, that all you're experiencing, Diana, is is the you know is the sort of chemical reality that your your brain's generating, and you can't really prove one way or the other until you die. So, you know, you you can think of it this way and you can think of it that way. It's a choice, it seems to me. Yeah, although there are some uh, pretty serious anomalies. I mean, there are near-death experiences with modern medicine. A lot of people are having near-death experiences. Yeah. And um, they are experiencing things which shouldn't be possible and which are verifiable yeah. and which pretty yeah. much, you know, pretty much prove or at least provide strong evidence for the, the idea that consciousness is not limited to the body and is not merely a product of the brain. Right. Well, I mean, I believe that's what I believe. That's what I, I think I go further than believing that. That's what I experience. Yeah. But to someone who, you you can't sort of really prove that for some. Well, I suppose yes. I suppose you're right in a way. Some of those near death experiences 
especially the Ibn Alexander, the neurosurgeon. Yeah, and um, many, that's, thousands of others. Uh, many too. thousands of others, I know. Yes, yeah. well, I, I mean, hopefully we're getting there because I, I think it's, I do think that the materialist assumption about everything has run its course and it's running us into a blind alley in a, in a great many different departments of, of our human experience. Um, and, and it's really time that the shock of the fact that we might actually be part of this amazing force of the universe. It, it, it's time that that dawned on us, I think. <laughs> I just think it's, a, it's such a terrifying thought to some people to actually take that on. You know, it's much easier to have a, the idea, although we know that in, in some areas anyway, Christianity is sort of dying a bit of a death. It certainly is here in England. Um, but, you know, it's on the rise in some parts of America, it seems. So I don't know. But no, Not really. <laughs> no. But, you know, there's a God somewhere. You, see, you feel that you live within a context where there's a, a larger, there's a larger context other than just what's here and then the so apparently a material world. And that's comforting to people. It has it gives them a sense of meaning, which is valuable, I think. Yeah. But as that gets undermined, and more and more undermined, and it was undermined already because of Darwin and the Enlightenment and Darwin and and um, genetics and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, people are left sort of on a little island of. Well, I've got, I've got, I've got relative most people anyway, not everyone. I've got a quite comfortable lifestyle, and I've got my children, some of us, and I, you know, I can make a cup of coffee anytime I want and mow the lawn and things like that. But is there a bigger, you know, is there something bigger here? And I, I think that's a wonderful prospect that will slowly be dawning on more and more of us. The danger of it is it becomes a theory. That, that That's a problem is when it becomes a fit, just like theoretical Christianity allows you to go and slaughter lots of people, you know. I mean, theoretical Christianity as opposed to really embodying the love that Christ talked about, yeah, you know, easily becomes a, a distortion, doesn't it? So a distortion of being spiritual beings would be almost worse, I think, than just being materialist beings. Some, sometimes I think about that. Yeah, that's an interesting thought. I mean, obviously, some horrible things have happened um, in the name of distorted spirituality. Yeah, Not, you know, starting yeah, well, has, starting yeah. with the Crusades, or <laughs> you yeah. know, uh, the the Inquisition, and you know, Jonestown, and all kinds of terrible things over the years. Um, so, just because something is called spiritual doesn't necessarily mean it's it's good. Um, and you thought about you you think about the the terror. What would you say? It's a terrifying thought that. Um, you know, that there might be a bigger reality. Uh, personally, I think that it's a terrifying thought that we're, we're just biological robots in a meaningless universe. Um, that, that's terrifying. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> and it actually, you know, I've, I've read articles about how it contributes to depression and suicide and so on, you know, because what does it matter if you kill yourself? The world is meaningless anyway, and, and, and if I die, that's no big deal because, I, uh, you know, I'm just going to cease to exist and there won't be any consequences. And, you know, it's just, it's a very warped view, in my opinion, um, and I would hate to live my life from that perspective. No, I agree. I, I, I also think it, the, the culture wars that we're sort of experiencing at the moment um, to do with Black Lives Matter and to do with gender, issues of gender. I think all of those, you know, the, the liberation of what, has, well, I don't know if they're minorities anymore, but people of different gender, you know, orientation, is, is, in, is all a part of evolution and, and expansion and is terribly important. But it feels to me like this, it's too narrow an identity that, that, that we're trying to sort of shove ourselves into there rather than remembering we're, we're much bigger than that. We're not, we're not just a, a sex gender person or not, you know. It's become, to me, it's become so narrow, that whole argument. I, I, I find it peculiar. It's, yeah. like, it's like an extreme of materialism. Because if that's all you are, you're going to fight about it, you know. Yeah, you know, one thing that you get into quite a bit in your book that I've been reading um, is the notion of, uh, let me see if I can even find a quote here. Um, basically that um, we don't have to take an either-or approach to what we are. Um, you know, we can um, 
enrich and even accentuate our individual uniqueness and at the same time um, anchor ourselves in universality. Oh. And then the, the two are not only, incom- not only not incompatible, but they are complementary and, and mutually enriching. They're in relationship. Exactly. Right. Yes. Right. So, so if you cut off, so I use that symbol of the vesica, you've got that there. I can I show that, yeah. I have one here that shows inner self and personality self. Yes, that's, it, that's great. That, yeah. that would do. Um, yeah, so that's, this is a, a symbol. I'm sure you're, many of your viewers will, will know this. It's called the Vesica Piscis or Pisces. And also people will know it as um, the, a Venn diagram. It's just, it's two equal circles. That they're uh, circumferences that overlap um, and intersect each other's centers. And it, it, it's, a, it's a, a very ancient symbol. It's a wonderful symbol. Um, but obviously in this instance, I'm just using it to indicate that there's an inner realm and an outer realm, and that we have an inner self and a personality self, and they overlap. And, you know, and so that, that the Venn diagram is where you're different and what you, what you share, you know, what's common. And what's common out of the two of them, you know, becomes our inner process and our, our uh, sense of self that's, you know, both determined by our DNA and our upbringing, but it's also determined by this much larger deeper inner self that you know we we have access to yeah um and you you say yeah don't worry about the dog i know it's hot over there and and uh i, <laughs> I told diana she could leave the window open even if the dog barks because it's so hot she needs fresh air <laughs> uh, it's going for it now. somebody should mind. throw him a snack <laughs> um you go into a whole interesting explanation about how kind of fragmented and and fractured uh, our thought process and our personalities become when we don't have access to the inner wholeness and yes. and the implications of that in society in terms of business and politics and economics and so on and so forth um it it might be interesting to explore that and it actually alludes back to something we started with a little earlier which is all that all the problems of the world are due to a lack of our access to inner potential well uh yes i think i mean that's been my that's been my passion really to try to explore how, why that is how that happens i i became fascinated by the um the arthurian myth and the grail myth where there's a wounded king who rules over a wasteland kingdom. And the kingdom, the ills of the kingdom are really just a reflection of his wound. And if you could heal that king, then the kingdom would sort itself out. And uh, seeing that as a metaphor for our human beings, when we are disconnected from that inner self, from that bigger space, which makes us feel bigger you know, it's like having a window open rather than a window closed. Um, so, so when we're, the, the wound is the sense of being disconnected from that. Now, when you're disconnected from that inner self, that inner self is also really your source of power. You know, that power that rose up in me in my transfiguration. Okay, I don't feel like that all the time. <laughs> but you, you can, you're always living somewhat in alignment with that inner energy of yourself or you cut yourself off from it a little bit from because you mostly because you hold thoughts that don't um sync up with the with the vibration of that energy so the the wound is if you're disconnected from that power and then you feel fearful and you you might feel uh, vulnerable and you also might feel very empty and so you therefore you're going to want to const- you're going to want to get something to make up for that sense of diminishment now in the myth uh, in the arthurian myth the grail king uh, sorry the fisher king he's called the wounded fisher king sorry and he's called the wounded fisher king because the only way he ever gets any relief from this wound doesn't heal him but he gets relief temporary relief from the suffering is when he goes fishing and I, I interpret that as when we feel this sense of vulnerability and diminishment and emptiness, we go get something to try to make us feel better. And it could be 
we become addicted in some shape or form to a substance, to alcohol, or we become sort of addicted in a way to power over others. We, we become a fully fledged narcissist and we sort of suck energy out of, of, of other people. Um, or we just buy lots of stuff that we don't really need. You know, we consume, we consume to try to make up for the emptiness. And so then, then you get into a vicious cycle. Um, Cause the more you do that, the more disconnected you feel. So the emptier you feel, so the more you uh, consume. And that to me is the vicious circle of, of addiction, fundamentally of addiction. There was a great quote from your book. You said, narcissism is the psychological sense, is the, in the psychological sense, is defined as an inferiority complex covered over by a superiority <laughs> complex. In other words, the partial sense of self is covered over by the inflation of itself. Yes, exactly. And um, y- yes, so to make up for the sense of not being truly whole, which is that stereo sense of identity that that symbol you know, kind of symbolizes that you've got this, you've got access to this other dimension consciously. You've always got that to draw on. But if you close off from that for whatever reason, and we can try, try to understand what that is, why, why that happens, um, you, can only, you can only make up for it through a form of inflation. Um, and I did experience that. I, 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 th- my thought process about this actually began partly um, when I visited Romania towards the end of uh, Ceausescu, who was the last, co- was maybe the first and last communist leader there. And he built this enormous palace in the center of Bucharest and he bulldozed people's homes to make way for it. And it was absolutely ginormous. And apparently it's the second largest building in the world after the, the, pe- before, you know, the Pentagon's bigger. I mean, it may have changed by now with Utah, you know, and the, the listening people, but... Um, and you walked around this building and half the rooms were unfinished. Um, chandeliers, enormous chandeliers w- were covered in plastic. Uh, there was a ballroom the size of Grand Central Station just about. And the finest craftsmen in the whole of Romania had been called to, to create this, this palace. And then at the end, there was a little visitor's book asking you, have you got any ideas as to what we can do with this place? <laughs> <laughs> and afterwards I thought, that was his ego. Yeah. I was walking around a physical symbol of this man's ego that, that, that particularly through the power vacuum in co- of com- communism, because all the other institutions were um, sort of done away with, you know, it, it had been allowed to just sort of grow uh, d- dis- disproportionately. Yeah. He also mentioned that he... he- ordered the digging of canals around the country that actually weren't leading anywhere or serving any purpose. He was irrational, yeah. And Stalin was irrational, too, yeah. Yeah, I think you mentioned Stalin, what, was he killed all of his best generals just before World War II or something? Yeah, apparently. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, we laugh now, but I mean, it's... um, No, irrationality goes along uh, with with this condition. I mean, you you could call it a sort of... A, a mental illness, really, a fundamental mental illness. And I think we've all experienced it personally, you know, to some extent, because we've all been cut off from our inner nature um, to varying degrees. And, uh, but, you know, there are these larger than life figures who somehow maneuver their way into political prominence um, who become like, you know, caricatures they're just so, so such extreme narcissists and then it's it's on display for all the world to see um, absolutely absolutely yeah i don't know where to how whether we're proceeding here very coherently just, but yeah um, coher- I, 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 coherence <laughs> is one of your favorite words so we have to we have to be coherent <laughs> uh, well but i was thinking you see um the idea of what spirituality is 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 obviously is evolving and you know, that, that I mentioned my, my experience of transfiguration. It didn't last. Um, and I don't think it's supposed to, you see. I, I, don't, I don't think we're supposed to always be in this ex- high, high, high thing. And I, I think actually people take drugs because it gives them some of that, doesn't it? It gives them that high. But what, what we are supposed to do, and this, this is the beautiful myth of the, the Grail story um, is all about this. We are supposed to sort of become aware of this and then 
learn to use it, learn to let consciousness work the way it's designed to work. And by that, I mean something very simple, which is really to do with using drawing on what we we tend to call our intuition. Because everyone has those experiences of pondering something, and it can be something immense and difficult, or it can be something simple, simple, or it can just be, well, should I do this now or should I do that now? And if you tune to your inner self, you can start to feel when it kind of lines up with, yes, we'll, do, we'll, we'll go this way. Some, but sometimes you have something really startling. It's like, oh, I've just downloaded a really amazing idea. I know it's, I know it's right. And I, I quote Einstein here because he, in my, in my book, I, I quote him because he was a big proponent of the importance of intuition in his own process of evolving his, and his theory about relativity. He said, sometimes I know I'm right, but I don't yet know the reason. Now, if you think about that, that's really interesting. How do we, because we all know, we've all had that experience. So how do we know we're right? We know this is the next thing to do. Out of all the chaos of our lives, of the world, of our mind, of our condition, of our circumstances, how do we know that? Well, it's because it, th- there's a sort of a line lining up between that. Uh, I don't know if, it's there, is there a picture with the lining up or maybe not? Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. Well, I have the one that's inner and inner and outer, and uh, heart and mind, and the circles are sort of inter- yeah. intersecting. So, the, so there's like a moray pattern in the middle, right? So if you think of the two two centers of the circle as as your heart and your mind, and the heart is more sort of it listens more to the inner, and the mind pays more attention to the outer, to our circumstances. Um, every now and again, that, that a line gets drawn between those two centers in our awareness it's like should I do this should I do that and then suddenly it goes you know and and the thing forms and the line is drawn between the two and that's when that field that you're talking about there um the the centers have have joined up the 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 circles have aligned that's it geometrically that's when you can draw a straight line from one center to the other yeah and that's the beginning of all the shapes of sacred geometry well that's to me that's an analogy I'm just talking of it as a metaphor for the experience we have when our heart and our mind line up and it's like we've we've got this intuitive flash and we know what we know what to do next. So th- why do we know we're right? Because it's connecting to the inner self. We it, it's there. It it it's actually there. You can and you can feel it. You can feel it guiding you in quite, you know, in large ways and, and, and in minor ways through your life. And I think that's so exciting. And that, you don't have to be a physicist to have that experience, do you? You, do, you don't need to understand quantum theory. <laughs> it might help not to be. I don't know. <laughs> 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 well, you yeah. know, a minute ago you said, um, you know, we can't really be in this super high state all the time. And um, I would like to suggest that we can be and that many people have been, um, but it's not necessarily going to be flashy or overwhelming or, or um, incapacitating um, because we will have integrated it. We will have acclimated to it. Um, but it, it, I, I fully believe that it's possible to function in that way all the time. Um, and, you know, and it doesn't necessitate sitting around in a loincloth and not being able to really do anything. Um, you know, a, a surgeon could be in that state, an airline pilot landing a 747 in a snowstorm. I mean, it's just a matter of um, having f- deep and frequent and clear experiences of that inner state and then alternating those with activity until eventually it becomes stabilized. And this thing about intuition that you mentioned, there's actually a, a term in the Yoga Sutras, which is um, Ritambara Pragya, which means that level of intellect, which knows only truth. And, you know, and th- theoretically, ideally, one can uh, become accustomed to functioning from that. And, um, and then one's intuition is, is I, w- I wouldn't want to say that it, it would be hubris to, to assume that one has become infallible and dangerous, but uh, it becomes reliable. And, uh, you know, perhaps it can always be checked against common sense or something. But there's, there's a lot of really cool stories of s- saints and sages who 
took some course of action, which even they didn't understand why they were taking. And then it, it, then the reason became obvious after a while. They, they met such and such a person, and, and it was just, they were there at the perfect time to do such and such. And you know, because you're just sort of operating on cosmic intelligence, which is larger mm-hmm. than your individual perspective. Mm. Well, I mean, I, I totally agree with you. And, and in different words, I think I, that's exactly what I'm. I think that's exactly what my book is about. Is that is it that you? It is possible to live from this. I just, I just that intensity of energy. I don't live from. I mean, it was, it was, you know, that was rather exceptional. Sure. It, it's there. I don't experience it. it. It's like I guess the fire's there, but I don't experience it that way anymore. But I think that that's that that calm, that sense of, as you say, contacting whatever words we use, intuit, intuitive certainty or sense of well-being. Um, that's the same, it's it's the same thing. It's just kind of, and I agree with you. I think we do get used to it. I, I think you do. And so the high, you know, if if you'd been in a real, and I think that's partly what happened when I was a, I was an eighty, I was a teenager, you know. So that you're very up and down as a teenager, and I think I had that breakthrough, and it was as extreme as it was because I'd probably been quite you know moody and um, de- you know a, a sort of ordinary teenager. And so to some degree, it was like something cracked open in my mind, my heart, and that I had that particular intensity. But I agree with you. I, th- I think we can live from, um, from our inner self. I, I, think, I, think that's, I think we're supposed to. I think that's how we're supposed to learn to think. Yeah. And, and obviously you don't just uh, download everything because you're from nowhere because you're in relationship with the world, with you think about things, whatever your particular focus of interest is, you know, you are, you engage with that, you become interested in it, you learn about it. So then you can become a good airline pilot because A, you've learned, you've trained, you've got the skills as an airline pilot. I mean, I couldn't be an airline pilot, even if I was very, you know, uh, in sync and attuned because I don't have that that knowledge in, in my, you know, in my psyche in my brain and in my body but so you so you learn those skills but then if you've also got this balancing this attunement whatever we want to call it then you've got both things happening and that's when you act in a way that isn't going to create damage in the world you know you know yeah and that's and that's when the wasteland gets restored you see that so you don't have to you don't have to sort out the the land you have to sort out the king or the airline pilot or Whoever it is. Yeah, one way of putting it is that a light bulb isn't isn't a toaster, isn't a refrigerator, isn't a you know an electric blender, but they they each have their function, but they're all plugged into the same electrical field. Exactly. And so we as individuals, you know, variety is the spice of life. All the all the plants in the Amazonian rainforest, as diverse as they are, are all um, planted in the same ground and derive their nourishment from that. Mm. And so, you know, the, what you're getting at is that we, we just have been deficient in our accessing that ground. Yes, and I think, I think we have been trained away from it mm. as well uh, through our education system, through the, through the cultural assumptions that surround us now. Um, I, I mean, I, probably it's a good and nat- necessary evolution overall you know because before as we mentioned you'd have had a more traditional structure let's say a church and with it you could sort of exist within that without necessarily really coming to know that in yourself you know you just you're just sort of anointed by the priest and told that you'll be all right when you're dead and that (laughs) sort of thing (laughs) you know it's different isn't it from really learning to live in this sense of grace or, or in this intuitively lined up sense um so then we you know we we lost but 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 we have been in an era of really really deep materialism and uh it's it's been damaging i think it's been damaging yeah and if anything i think the churches have contributed to it um because what always seems to happen is that administrative types take over when a religion gets started and pretty soon they start persecuting the mystics who are actually having the experience that the founder of the religion was talking about and (laughs) and, you know then the whole thing just becomes an outer shell without any inner juice Mm -hmm. yeah hey did you ever see that movie the fisher king with robin williams i did 
Yeah. I can't remember it very well now. It was years ago, but he was, was traumatized and damaged. That's and right. He became a homeless person. I don't remember if he actually literally fished, but it was a, it was a great movie. It was a great movie. Yeah. <clears throat> um, okay, so I have a bunch of notes in front of me, and I could start us off on something, but um, where shall we go without being too jumpy in our train of thought? <laughs> um, well, there's the whole thing about David Bohm and his implicate and expl expl explicate orders, which I think ties into what we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. may maybe, maybe we should go there. You want to explain what that's about? Well, um, yes. Well, well here, here was a language that David Bohm has came up with, a, a remarkable new idea. Um, and it, it, it emerged out of him trying to uh, basically trying to sort of figure out why, you know, why do electrons appear and disappear and what the double slit experiment and all that sort of thing, which, I, you know, I'm not completely I'd have to I always have to look those things up to talk about them with, with total authority or much, some authority. But um, essentially, he, he, he said, um, you know, instead of looking for a little um, building block somewhere, some sort of quark or something rather that, that, that the rest of the universe is made up out of, he, he turned it all on its head and he said, um, the universe itself has an interior quality to it. it, it, it it's, and it's, and it's materialness, including the little electron that pops in and out or quark or whatever it is, um, emerges out of this deep interior order, displays itself for us for a while, and then it folds back into it. And he, he's, he called this the hollow movement or the, the, what was it, the unbroken wholeness. Beautiful phrase, I always think, unbroken wholeness. So our bodies um, appear and grow and then gradually, gradually sort of start to sort of fall apart a bit and we die. So we have an idea. The, where does the idea come from? It, so it, it comes into our mind and takes form and then it sort of becomes archived, I suppose. Um, but meanwhile, that, that body, you know, me in the world, um, I've emerged out of what he called the implicate, let's say. I've emerged, which is the inner, using simple words, into the explicate, which is the dimensional, the outer, and I'm interacting both with that outer world and with the inner world. And by doing so, I expand meaning. I expand the meaning of both of those things. I expand the meaning of the inner world and I expand the meaning of the, of the outer world. So, so that every, this, is hap, this, everything, this is what everything is. You know, an idea, a sunflower, a human being um, it emerges out of an interior order and, it, it, and it's here for a while and it looks like it's really solid this table that i'm sitting by looks very solid but eventually it it will you know rot and fall away and it'll be burnt or whatever it is and it will it will disappear actually it never actually leaves the explicate does it because it's it, it's um it just changes its nature i suppose within the within the explicate order but some of its substance will disappear so um, he, he was saying that rather than be thinking in terms of separate realities, separate human beings, separate countries, um, things in conflict, to be thinking in terms of, uh, of a state of profound oneness and that everything, like you were saying about the Amazon forest, is really a differentiation of this deep inner order. Uh, and this is a very different way of looking at the world, thinking about the world, thinking about ourselves. Um, and human consciousness, by means of that inner and outer, we are designed to participate in this expansion of, of meaning. Um, because, you know, we, we, we see something, I don't know, I use, in my book I use an example of um, having coffee with a friend and... Um, the idea of having coffee is the implicate, having coffee is the explicate, but then having sitting there having coffee, I see a tree or something, and the tree makes me begins a poem in my head, 
So then the tree is the explicate, but it started something in the implicate in, in, in me that then will come back out into the explicate as a poem or a draft of a poem. So that the, the universe is continually expanding through, uh, through our consciousness. Here's a couple of Bohm quotes that uh, state what you were saying. In terms of the implicate order, one can ascribe the phenomena or behavior of some subatomic particles to a deeper reality that underlies them. So there's that. And then according to Bohm, this is the fundamental implication of quantum theory. There is no ultimate material building block to be found. It is not commonly realized that the quantum theory implies that no such bottom level of unambiguous reality is possible. And so in simple terms, I think he's just saying that there is a deeper reality to anything which could be said to be manifest to any degree, including subatomic particles, and that those subatomic particles and that all the various levels of manifestation above them derive their orderliness and their organizing power, which makes them too, too coherent to any degree, from the ocean of coherence that resides at their at their core, at their root, at their foundation. Mm, yes. Something along those lines. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very, very different vision. Um, and what's so interesting is that he, I mean, I don't know when he first said this, but quantum physics, as he said, he, yeah, what he said was people don't commonly realize that there is no, you, you, the implication is there isn't anything there. There isn't any fundamental building block. and Not of a that, material uh, nature, no. Of a material nature. And um, what, I don't know, quantum physics was emerging in the early 20th century, right? The, the 1920s and 30s. But we're, st we're still here. We're here in 220. It's 100 years later. And we're still fundamentally uh, um, operating from a, a, a material, you know, a building block perspective. In everything, in it, I say we, I mean the main, so called mainstream culture and everything we do. Um, and, and including looking for meaning, you know, what is meaningful to us is mostly just a lot more money, you know. Certainly in America, it is. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. it is. It is. It is in many places. And um, what what's meaningful to human beings is is relationship, meaningful relationship with other people, primarily. That's and with it, with their own with their own sense of self. So our values are skewed, and our, our, our thinking's are skewed. Our, our sense of who we are is skewed. And that's been trained. That's been trained into us through our education, through other people, um, and therefore that's one of the reasons why we we tend to negate our intuition. We don't learn this this subtle thing, or we lose it as we grow up. We doubt it, you know. And we've we've probably come up against um, not very helpful mentors who perhaps didn't encourage us or who tried to make us be different to the way we were and different ways, you know. That, that can also um, squash that process a bit, can't it, of connecting with your deeper being? Well, because the mentors themselves aren't in touch with their deeper being. No. Um, and it carries on, you know, inherited exactly. from one generation to the next. There's a verse in the Gita, which I've quoted many times, which I think pertains to this, and that is that it goes, um, for many branched and endlessly diverse are the intellects of the irresolute, but the resolute intellect is one-pointed. I think a good analogy for that is like a, a bicycle wheel where you have the hub and then you have all the spokes radiating out from the wheel, um, from the hub. And most people are out on the end of some spoke. Yeah. And from that pers perspective, all the other spokes seem to be a jumble. They don't, th there's no coherent pattern that you can discern. But if you, were, if you reside at the hub, you see all the spokes radiating out from you. Mm. And so, you know, the resolute intellect is one-pointed. And so you are no longer many-branched and endlessly diverse. You can explore the various diversities. You can go out on this spoke mm. or that spoke, but you maintain contact with the hub. You maintain, that's your essential identity. And so everything, a coherence dawns in your perspective that isn't possible if you're stranded out on the periphery someplace. Yes, very much so. 
um, I, I think that again to use the, to use that symbol of the the intersecting circles and the idea of the of the wounded king as this symbol of the wounded king. That's you're also you know you you can be control you're controlled then by your environment you know rather than being in under the sway of your own authority in a way yeah uh you you're you're under the thrall of of what's outside of you what one way or another whether you dominate it or whether even if you seem to be dominating it you know like a a narcissist you're still actually under its thrall it's it's really it's in control of you the, the environment's in control of you. Yeah. There's other, another verse in the Gita where I think Arjuna asked Krishna, you know, what is it that compels a man to commit sin, even though he knows better? You know, why is he sort of driven blindly to do what he... I think Duryodhana, or Arjuna's opponent, said, I know what's right, but I can't do it. And, and I know what's wrong, but I'm impelled to do it. Um, and I think it's, again, like lack of grounding groundedness in the source um you are at the mercy of forces that are beyond your control kind of like trying to control a river from halfway downstream or from all the way downstream the river has already run its course you can't control it from there it has to be controlled from its source if you hope to you know have any influence on it well what i think about there also is um that I can't, you know, I know I'm wrong, but I can't control myself. In a way, it's because you're searching for something. You, you, you want, you want, you're trying to find something, some beauty, perhaps, some something to, to sort of take you out of yourself. Yeah. And um, out, that's out of your because, limited self. Exactly, out of your limited self. Because when when you're lined up, and it doesn't, as I say, I mean, it's you're not always it comes and goes, right? But the the experience of being lined up is like uh, it's it's like the sun shining through the window. So the world becomes illuminated by that light, and that's what beauty is, and that's what's that's so satisfying. It doesn't happen all the time, you know. It's like those um, epiphany. That's what it, it's like an epiphany, right? When the world is lit up as you look at it, it's it's the most satisfying experience. And all, all the hunger and all the sort of edginess, um, you know, it doesn't cease forever, but it's, it's you, you found what you're looking for. You found this sense of meaningful relationship with the world. And then that feeds back into you as this sense of beauty and, and fulfillment. And that's, you know. Yeah, that's nice. Um, I guess maybe one way of phrasing what you're saying is... Um you know, once once one is established in the self, then the appreciation of the world can really become sublime. And that, that appreciation um, kind of creates a feedback loop where there's greater and greater sort of expansion of the heart and greater enrichment and further refinement of, of sensory appreciation. So, you know, so it, it just sort of grows and grows. Are you kind of saying that? Yes, I, I, I yes. Yes, but it seems to me that that's what that hunger in people is when they just can't, you know, they they just want that. I and see, I don't even think it's wrong to want things and to get the shiny car or the lovely house or anything because that's part of the joy of life. But it it it's it's the it's whether it's done to fill the emptiness or whether it's done as a sort of outflow of creativity. Mm -hmm. You know, it, I, icing it, on the cake or something. Yeah, I think I'm the <laughs> Yeah. Well, I think we all know intuitively that a great reservoir of happiness resides within it within us. I mean, not that many people could actually articulate that, um, but I think it's built into us just like our desire to breathe, you know, we just got to breathe. It's this human um, impulse. I mm -hmm. think I think deep deep down we all realize that um, you know, that there is this vast reservoir of happiness and energy and intelligence within us and we must also realize that we're estranged from it and like you say you know we we want to fill the gap there's a natural tendency to seek greater happiness and oh mm. maybe, maybe it's here oh maybe it's there and you know we're constantly disappointed because that's not it uh, no. <laughs> um but there's nothing wrong with those things it's just that no. 
you yeah. know, who, who was it? Thoreau said, um, you know, go ahead and build your castles in the air. That's where they belong. Just put foundations under them. Or it might have, <laughs> been, might have been Emerson. I don't know. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is how to do it. Um, you know, the easier said than done, perhaps, or maybe not. Um, you know, how do we access that inner uh, source that we and that we dimly or clearly realize exists, exists. Well, I think that, um, you know, I'm sure you, like yourself, I, I just do some very simple meditation every morning. Um, I don't meditate very long, only about 15 minutes. And all I'm really doing is trying to, is just clearing, clearing the mind of thought so that I retune to the frequency of my source, which can happen quite naturally i think yeah um and you've been doing that for a long time i've been doing that for a long time yeah and do you feel that there's a progressive familiarization with that source yes i i and and, and also i find that i'm much more aware I'm much more familiar also with how the feeling of the day goes mm. um and when it's out of kilter and yeah. when it isn't and i think this, I, and this relates to what you said earlier. I think that the more this becomes quite natural, it becomes so sort of subtle and natural. You don't really, it doesn't seem like anything very special. You know, it's not like fireworks or anything going on. You're just living your life in your day, but you're enjoying yourself. But what, what you do notice is when you're out of kilter, it's almost unbearable. Having been in, in kilter, to go out of kilter, you just can't bear it. And that's that's very interesting and you, you you know you see that lots of people around you um they're they're still it's being like caught up in your own consciousness it's caught up in your own it's like you're trapped in your own apparatus in a, in a funny sort of way um and that becomes unbe- that's just unbearable now i can't i can't bear it i, I can't i know what I you mean i can't stand it <laughs> anymore <laughs> yeah i I, I, pr- I particularly went through a phase of i got it i lost it back in the 80s and it was like I can't wait to go to sleep tonight so I can just sort of be unconscious again. And you can imagine how somebody would take heroin or something because they just want to blot out the, the pain. Um, but, you know, relative, exactly. relative to what I had been experiencing 20 years earlier, I was probably in a very blissful state. But I, <laughs> I had just become accustomed to that. And if it's lost temporarily, then it's, it's rough. Yeah. So I, I don't know. That, that, uh, that, that process is... You see, I, I'm very interested in in the language of myth. That myth is um, a language about all of this stuff. I don't know if you're if, we, if you want to go there. Let's go there. But um, let me just ask yeah. a couple of questions that came in that okay. seem to be related to the things we've been talking about. Okay. Um, first one from John in Western North Carolina, which is his question: Because of our culture and the way we are taught to learn in Western education. Is there a step-by-step approach to aligning our heart and mind? And going further, is there a step-by-step approach suggested for attaining enlightenment? Um, what is the first step, the second, et cetera? This kind of alludes to what we were just saying. Meditation is one way, but um, is, is there anything more you can say to John's question? Well, I think nowadays, um, a mentor, you know, having some form of mentor um, can be helpful. And there are so many people around now who've got some training in meditation or whether you meet them physically or whether you listen like now online or, or, or read a book, um, you know, that might, what would I do? Uh, it's a good question, isn't it? I, I don't, oops. Um, I do think meditation is the key meditation and, um, noticing when your thoughts go out of, you know, noticing, trying to notice what your thought process is doing. Yeah. During during the day, so that when it, it starts going, which it does, it, it goes off. Or you start getting fearful or critical. You start getting angry. You you might just try to write something down. Write, writing things is um, I, I do that. I make lists of things. I I write things. I notice when something really bothers me, and I'll work with it a little bit and try to get to the core of it. There's so many books with steps in them. Um, I I I'm not, I don't have I don't have like a formula that I I've never really thought about it that way. Right. I, I've just been fascinated by um, 
deciphering these myths and sort of trying to say, lay out the the anatomy of who we are and how, how that works. Um, so med- to me, meditation is, is the first step for sure. Yeah. For sure. And I think uh, another thing is to have a realistic understanding of the nature of spiritual evolution, which is that it's, it's, it's not a McDonald's approach where you're just going to sort of have some big flash and then it's over. It's really a lifelong project, which is actually not a discouraging idea. It's inspiring because one's entire life is an adventure of exploration and, and growth. Um, but it's, but the, it's, I think it's important to understand that there are many degrees of awakening. And I've seen instances where people mm-hmm. have some degree of awakening and then just assume that they're done or th- mm-hmm. that they're at a state where whatever they wish to do must be okay because they're kind of an enlightened dude. Um, and that can result in your downfall. And it has huh. resulted in the downfall of many. So um, it's good to sort of have the what Padmasambhava approach, which is that um, he said, although my awareness is as vast as the sky, my my attention to karma or action is as fine as a grain of barley flour. So to walk the razor's edge and and be diligent and and mindful um, as you go along, without being overly neurotic about it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I also think just. Acting in the world, you know, doing things, getting things done mm-hmm. is quite challenging. Can be. But I think, and I think that's good for, that's, that's kind of, um, you grow by doing things, don't you, by achieving things. I mean, I don't know, my own experience writing a book and trying to write it as well as I can, it's very demanding. It's not easy. I'm not in a state of bliss doing that all. <laughs> so, but the experience of doing it, works the mind it's just like exercise you know works your it's not, it not it's not just the mind it's a uh, it's stamina it's the ability to stay with things um and and sort of building a belief in yourself so i think as much as we want to be spiritual it, working in the world working with the sort of challenges of, of the day of our daily lives that's that is a spiritual practice i think Absolutely. doing it well yeah. being being present within it, being patient. You know, there's always, well, in my house at the moment, there's always the washing up because we haven't got a dishwasher. But, I mean, there are always these routine things of life that seem to seem to kind of um, defeat us, you know, because we, we want a great destiny, but we've got to go and do the washing up or we've got to write this letter or, you know, clean the house. I'm trying to think of something. No, well, the, writing a book, you know, that draws forth, it, it forces you to draw forth your inner resources. So in that sense, it's, it's like you're, you're drawing forth potential that otherwise might not be drawn. And you're infusing that into your mind-body system, so it becomes more uh, your customary way of functioning. And having to wash the dishes and do mundane stuff, you know, that can culture patience. Uh, where you can, you know, rest in, in contentment in the self, even though you're doing something that is not <clears throat> intrinsically gratifying. Uh, so, I mean, life is our guru, you know, and every, everything has some yes. in- intelligent lesson for us. And um, it seems to me that it, to, to know that one is this powerful being, even if it's only a theory, mm-hmm. to know that you are incredibly powerful, to meditate so that you start to tune into it and quiet your mind and then notice that and then to take on whatever it is you really want to do that something that challenges you that inspires you whatever it is knowing it knowing you can do it but you can't just do it instantly it's going to take engaging with the world and to get engaging with that skill set you know again coming back to the airline pilot it's a good analogy always that one you've got to learn to do it sure you've got to learn to do it before you can fly the plane and ha- but having the spiritual um, stamina, I think that's I think that's I think that's probably its most useful. It can it can encourage you to do difficult things, yeah, or hard work, or tricky things, or taking on odd interactions with people that are uncomfortable that you don't quite know what the what the goalposts are. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? To, it it challenge it it makes you feel safe in the unknown to take on what's unknown. Because you've got you've got guidance. 
you've got guidance and your um, your intent your contentment is not contingent upon the fulfillment or the failure of your enterprise. No, your sense of worth isn't. Your sense of value right. isn't. Yes. I mean, one way of looking at it is like somebody who has ten dollars to his name, gaining or losing five bucks is a big deal. Someone who's a multimillionaire could gain or lose thousands, you know, and it wouldn't really shake him much because he's got that foundation. Right. I don't know if that helped answer that question. I think it did. And okay. um, there's one more here from Eric in Sebastopol, California. Uh, how does one recognize their true nature or self guided by these teachings? I see substantial and complex references to many ideas of self and culture, myth, archetypes, bones, implicate and explicate orders. It appears so overwhelming to me. How can these be more accessible? Oh, gosh. Well, um, I mean, it is very... That, okay, so what I, I can see why he's saying that, because I, I became very interested in the fact that there's this fundamental pattern in a self personality self and I like that idea because we're familiar with the idea that we have a, an inner self you know a deeper self or a spiritual self or a soul or something along those lines we may not know exactly what that means what it feels like who it is how to contact it but we, we're familiar with that idea but what we're not so familiar with is the fact that that self is in relationship it's in partnership with the sense of self that we are more familiar with in daily life, I should say, rather than as an idea, which is our personality self. That's us. That's the one, the person who was born here and had these parents and has brown eyes and is, you know, this, this kind of heredity or that kind of heredity, those kinds of experiences. These two, these two sense, these two aspects are put together. That, that whole package is us. So, Here's your person. You're already here. You, you, you're, you've got your personality self. Um, that's done. That's there. So now it's, it's about becoming aware of the inner self. And you can do that through meditating, just quieting the mind. And you can do it through noticing your in, how your intuition works. You can do it through noticing when you have an idea or noticing when you feel a sense of happiness and joy for no particular reason. You know, it's not something nice has happened to you, so you feel nice. You just feel a sense of well-being for no particular reason. That's, that's you. That's who you're experiencing then. So then all this other stuff about the myth and David Bohm and everything, I'm, I'm, using, I'm just showing here's this fundamental, this fundamental presence that we have that's at the core of ourselves sorry i'm looking looking the wrong place sometimes <laughs> just as we're talking to this person uh, <laughs> you've got this we've got this presence it's it's right there it's there all the time there's nothing mysterious about it it's a it's a resource that we have and it's just about quieting perhaps quieting the mind and uh looking for the um like i was saying that sense of something lining up an idea that works, or I think I'll do this now, not that, or uh, it's something very, very simple to begin with, and then we get better and better at doing it. It's just like any other skill. Yeah. Is that helpful? Does that does, does that I, begin to answer that a bit? I think it does, and he can always um, ask again if he is not satisfied. But I, I really believe in that saying, you know, seek and you shall find, knock and the door shall be opened. I've seen it so many times that if a person has a sincere intention to get into this stuff, you know, to, uh, to discover the deeper spiritual reality, um, then just take the first step, you know. Um, and, you know, you're not going to get enlightened tomorrow or anything, but just start, start exploring and see what resonates with you. I mean, one of the ideas of this show is that it's like a smorgasbord of all kinds of different teachings and teachers and perspectives and everything. And you, some may resonate with you and some may not. Uh, but, you know, if you, if you have the sincere intention, nature will organize and, you mm. know, the, the right thing will come along at the right time. And then, then the next thing will come along and, and so on. And, uh, you know, it's just a, it's a, it's a delightful journey. And um, 
you know, it bears fruit, in my opinion. Mm. It's, yeah. it, you won't be disappointed if you sincerely pursue it. Yeah. Okay, so you wanted to get into myth. And well, uh, just before, that, that, that makes me want to say something about um, sure. the power of consciousness itself, like you yeah. were saying there, the power of intention there, because one, one of the implications in the myth and in Bohm's work and in spiritual traditions is that consciousness, the reason why it's so important to be attuned to our deeper self is because our consciousness and the world are woven together. You, you can't separate our consciousness from the world. And this is really the mystery at the heart of quantum physics. Um, so what that means is that how we live and who we are impacts the world, whether we like it or not, it does. But it, it also means that we have power over the world. So if you put out intention, I want to discover my inner self, whatever it is. That's like a seed. It's a vibration that stirs matter. It's, it stirs the sort of deeper matter of the world, should we say. It starts to stir it to bring to you what you want to do, or how, what you need to take your next steps, just like you, you said. And, and that's the other thing that I, I think we're going to start understanding more as we go along into the next few decades, that we shape the world. Consciousness shapes the world. And that's what magic really is. You know, that the spell, the spell of making, casting the spell of making, or God said, let, let there be light and there was light. That's That opening part of Genesis is a, is a poem talking about the power of consciousness to create, you know, to, to, to summon up what you want from the world. And I think it's a very precious and much needed intention to, to know oneself and, you know, to, to unfold one's spiritual nature. It's, it's still, even though in, in the circles of people who watch this kind of show, it seems very commonplace, it's in the world at large, it's still rather rare. And I think that everyone who steps on that train is very much appreciated um, and, mm. and supported by whatever powers there be, <laughs> um, it's, it's critical and for the survival of the world. And so um, if, you know, if you really pursue that um, endeavor, you, you'll, you'll be appreciated and you'll receive support. Mm. And that mm. may not have always been the case. I mean, there are times when you could have been burned at the stake for dabbling in this stuff. Uh, but in this day and age, you know, ancient secret teachings are just f f there on YouTube for everyone to see. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and, and there's also, and, there's also all kinds of nonsense on YouTube for everyone to see, which can totally confuse you if you indulge in it. So, you know, be careful where you put your attention. <laughs> and then the authorities don't really care about it. So they're not going to burn you at the stake. Yeah. They're not interested in it. <laughs> yeah. Myth, myth is like a dream. Like sometimes you have a very powerful dream um, that you remember when you wake up and it stays with you. And then I, I know I've had the experience sometimes of you think about the, something in the dream, you suddenly make a correlation between this thing in the dream and something in your real life. And suddenly you understand, ah, that, oh, the dream's about that. But then you also know, oh, but this also shows light on that, you know, this thing in the dream of the way it was being moved around or whatever was happening was saying something about that thing that in my real life that it correlates with. And you go backwards and forwards between understanding the dream in terms of the world and understanding the world in terms of the dream. And it sort of stretches out a fabric of understanding, which I find very pleasurable when that happens. I, 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 I like doing that with some of my own dreams and I interpret the dreams of my family and friends when they've had particularly dramatic dreams. Well, myth is like that, to me anyway, and the, the myths of King Arthur and the Grail Quest are like a collective dream. I, th I think the big myths, they're like a, a dream that we've all had. And so they're not just about us as individuals, although they are about us as individuals, but they're about the whole culture. And... Um, the, so the King Arthur myth is the collective story 
uh, of moving towards wholeness, the, the round table. And the grail story is the individual thread um, of what it takes to, um, you might meet your King Arthur, or you might meet a mentor, and you might be inspired by him or her, um, but you've got to go off on the quest to find your own part of that. You've got to find your own deep connection with that. In other words, a mentor is great, but you, don't want to, you need to be weaned from them eventually. You need to get weaned from whoever it is. Uh, because I've seen it, and I'm sure others have seen it, where you just stay dependent and you never grow up. And you can always tell a true mentor because they don't want that to happen. They they'll don't boot want you that, out they, eventually. Yeah, they'll boot yeah. you out. Yes. The one who wants you to stay around, that's more the wounded king because they're, they, they're driving their power from you. So what do you, So how do you do this? So this is going back to this question. You go off on the quest, and the quest begins in the thickest part where there's no path. You know, there's, So you, you, it begins usually in chaos. And um, bit by bit, the story unfolds. You meet certain characters and... So the Grail story of Percival, uh, there's different Grail stories, but the one I focus on is is got a young lad called Percival. And his name means Percival, means to pierce the veil. And thinking about my two circles again, uh, the centerpiece can become veiled. I haven't sent you that, but it, it can be, it can become, you know, is there a, it, are the worlds joined or are they separated? You know, is there a veil in your heart so that they, the worlds are separated or are, or, or is it open and the, are they joined? Uh, so that's what his name is, is asking, per, Percival, pierce the veil. You've got to pierce the veil. Yeah. That's his job because he doesn't know it. Anyway, he has various adventures and um, he overcomes lots of wicked knights. He also is uh, mentored by a very well-meaning knight who teaches him the skills of, of knighthood. And, um, but he also realizes that Percival is a bit foolish and naive and unsophisticated. So he advises him not to talk too much so that he doesn't show to others that he's a little bit naive. <laughs> so he sets off again. He's trying to get home to, to find his mother again. Um, but of course he never goes home again because once you start on the quest, you can never go back to your normal world. You've changed, you've changed. So your world's going to change. He comes to the to the Grail Castle, which is where the wounded king lives, and he's invited into the banqueting hall. He sits down next to the uh, wounded king, and they start having a lovely meal served to them. And then suddenly, a door at one end of the banqueting hall opens, and a young woman comes through carrying the Grail chalice, golden bowl, golden cup. And as she comes into the room, there's so much light in this cup. Uh, the, it's as if the sun has come out and Percival looks at this grail and he thinks to himself, I really, I really wish I knew who, who that grail's for. Who's going to be served from that grail? What, what's it all about? But he remembers his advice um, from his, his, his kindly mentor. And he thinks, no, I mustn't ask any questions. I've got to keep silent. So he doesn't ask. And the grail carries across the room and um, disappears into another door on the other side of, of the hall. And that's it. That's the end. And, and he goes on his way, and he's, he's then um, told off by various uh, females that he should have asked whom the grail served. Because if he'd asked who the grail was for, he would have healed the wounded king, and then he'd have, healed, he'd have you know, restored the wasteland. So, of course, uh, Percival doesn't understand any of this. Why would his asking have healed the king? Because the grail... Okay, so at this point, that scene in the grail castle turns into a symbol. And the grail, the golden cup, represents the heart, represents our heart. And as it moves through that banqueting hall, it's moving from... It's giving its attention to the outer, and it's moving through into an inner room which we don't see into, and in that inner room, an elderly man lives who is very refined, and he really is a symbol of God in a way. So it goes, it goes from the outer into the inner where it serves the being, your inner being, your inner self, right? That's, that's what that's symbolizing. So it's saying uh, your heart serves this inner being. It serves your inner self. 
That's what it's supposed to connect to. That's your intuition when it tells you, yes, this is the way to go. That's the way to go. You've got to disengage from being so distracted by the outer and connect again. And that's when you have the, that's the light comes in. That's your epiphany. That's your sense of epiphany. So what Percival is learning at this point is that he's, he's no longer kind of finding meaning from being in the world and adventuring and having overcoming nights and um, training. You know, up to this point, all the sense of meaning has been outside of him. But what he must learn from his experience in the Grail Castle is that meaning lies within him and he's got the power after that to change the world. And that, that's what that um, myth is telling us. So it's like um, a narrative about our own consciousness. And, and this is why myths are so, so here's a dream, you know, it's not completely logical, it's a little bit surreal, um, but it's telling us about how consciousness works and that we have to understand exactly what you said. Why does it, you know, what does it mean, that question? Whom does the grail serve? Well, it's about becoming consciously aware of how you work. You've got to understand. You may have the epiphany, you have the experience, but you've, you don't understand the meaning, right? But you've got to come to understand that, what that means. Interesting. There's a section in your book where you talk about um, how the loss of wholeness in ourselves leads to the loss of wholeness in the world around us, to unethical behavior, to depleted values. We increase short-term gain at the expense of the long-term well-being of others. We extract commodities from the environment to buy and sell, no matter the impact. And you even talk about the, you know, the 2008 financial crash where, you know, all that weird complex derivative training and Enron's crash and all these people sort of really um, lost to themselves, but having gained great power in the world and really messing things up for large portions of humanity. Um, creating a wasteland. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, that's what the wound does. It always creates a wasteland. Um, and that, that was a very good example of... Uh, extremely arrogant people who uh, believed only really that the, the meaning is just about more, you know, more, more money, more whatever, um, crashing the economy. And um, there's, there, there it is again. They weren't um, supreme leaders like uh, Stalin, but they, they were still operating under that um, wound. Yeah. Well, even today, I, I saw this thing from Bernie Sanders yesterday, which I didn't read in its entirety, but he was saying how, you know, the, the, some 400 billionaires in the country have, have become $700 billion richer during the uh, financial crisis caused by the pandemic. And, you know, whereas meanwhile, they're, you know, the, the politicians in Washington are arguing over, you know, cutting the $600 in unemployment benefits that weekly that, that unemployed people are receiving. So there's, there's still something really rotten at the core of the policies, it seems to me, that govern, govern our society and our economy. Um, and I, th I think it does stem from what you're talking about, that, that this is sort of... Um, there's not a sort of a national the, the, the self-realization or enlightenment or higher consciousness or something is far from being the norm in collective consciousness, and we're still very much suffering the consequences of that. Very much. But it shows you how important it is, because, um, because otherwise you create a wasteland. You, yeah. you're actually, you start creating a wasteland. And I don't think it's going to come from our leaders now. I, I think, I think the, sh the shift is going to have to come about in, in, the, in, in the grassroots, in shifting the nature of the culture and coming to understand that quantum physics actually has enormous spiritual implications, coming to understand what these myths have been telling us. There are, there are psychic DNA that are telling us how we work and who we are. And it's not just about a nice lifestyle. It's not about just relaxing, you know, or blissing out or something like that. It's fundamental to the well-being of the ecology and of the planet and of a society being in balance. So, see, when we lived in America, that was something I could not understand, was that fundamental values didn't seem to even be known anymore. 
you know, it, I mean, the, the other myth that comes to mind is the story of Midas, who everything he touched turned to gold, which was wonderful to begin with. But then he touched his wife and he touched his beautiful, his beloved daughter. And he touched, his, touched his food. And then he touched his food. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so that was it. Yeah. <laughs> so so um, if there's only one thing you value, you kill off. You, you kill off the ecosystem of, of what really brings joy. Yeah. You know, which is a functioning society, you know, like where, where people are enjoying themselves and thriving. You know, why would you do that? It's, it's not rational. I think it really matters what leaders we elect, because if you have a, um, you know, a malignant narcissist uh, in the White House, he can do a lot of damage. Um, but um, on the other hand, if we assume, as you were just saying, that you know, changing leadership is going to solve things for us once and for all, well, then look at the history of that. Um, you know, mm-hmm. it, it obviously, you know, many, there are many extreme examples, such as Germany, which has learned that uh, the wrong leader in power can, can destroy the country. Um, and, you know, but on this, uh, ultimately, I think the time has come, hopefully, to finally realize collectively that we we've got to just shift collective consciousness uh, yeah. because and that will give us better leaders and everything else will fall yeah, into it place. grows out of that i i think it does it's an ecology and that takes time to build to yeah. build to build up and um unfortunately you it just just kind of pulling things apart doesn't necessarily help either um <laughs> You know, you you've got to work. You've got to work with what is, and and let it sort of gradually ameliorate and improve because because the fundamentals are starting to shift. I mean, you could say materialism has taken us down this route. You know that the only meaning is more and more money. Yeah, and it's kind of reached the end of its rope, hasn't it? Um, it has. I it mean, really has. It, it, the whole environmental crisis, which some don't even see as a crisis, is right. Um, you know potentially able capable of exterminating all life on earth yeah. in, in, within this century um yeah. and so it's like you know do or die at this point in terms of <laughs> spiritual renaissance <laughs> i mean i'm an optimist i i, think I am too being, i i think these are changed i think this is changing i think what i you know you feel like a small a small a small beacon but in in a large uh oblivious world but i was what i really wanted to try to do through the non-fiction books i write was to make the case to take spirituality seriously it it isn't just a, a nice little new agey add-on thingamajig it's it's front and center yeah how do you say uh, that in some of your other books i've only been reading one of your books well, what, only, what are some of I've the points you make to, well i've only read to, well i mean i I take the whole, I've only read two, uh, sorry, I've only written two um, nonfiction books because I, I try, I want to also try and explore this through, as I do through poetry and more through fiction. But I, I've, I, the way I use it is because I, I'm not a, you know, I, I, I'm not a physicist. So I, I can't use, I can't use that. I can't write about that. But I can write about my own experience of alignment, my own experience of working within communities, and uh, the myth. You see, I so I, I, the myth is our collective dream, that King Arthur myth. Because my co- this new book, Coherent Self, uh, Coherent World, talks about the Grail myth again. It brings it back in to to explore um, as another language, along with Bohm and uh, Buddhism and. Um, whatever else I, I'm touching into. <clears throat> I just want, my aim is to make the case of how important this is, that, 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 that myth, when it says, if you're wounded, you create a wasteland. It's not kidding. It, it, it's absolutely accurate. It, it accurately symbolizes the, the sort of circuitry that's going on in consciousness in all of us that we need to understand and learn about. Mm. Did you ever watch that movie Coyona Squatsy? I think it was pronounced. 
Yeah, a long time ago. Yeah, yeah, it was about world out of balance. I think that's what the word Koyanos Kwatsi meant. And it just had all yeah. this f- kind of I remember. intense music and all this yeah. footage of just the pace of life <laughs> and everybody just running around in neon <laughs> lights. And, you know, ugh. it just it gave you a real <laughs> sense of how out of balance the world is. <laughs> Yeah. And then I think they made another movie about the world coming back into balance or something. Oh, okay. But um but you know, I think most people watching this would concur that that you know, that's we really need the the spiritual renaissance to create balance. We And and to go and to grow up, you know, to go to its next stage, I think, to 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 to, to have uh to mature from what I'm not that it's been immature. But aspects of you, what we used to call the new age, have have sort of, you know, well, I know people try and put put it down. I don't. I think the new age has been an enormously important development. It's been totally grassroots. It's been, it's you know, it's differentiated into myriads and myriads of different fields. Uh, most of them very ben- all beneficial. Um, but it's. I think we've got to take the next leap. We've got to make the connection between that and our outcome. It makes a difference to the way you actually think, the way you, the thoughts you have, the ideas you come up with, the extent to which you are coherent in, in your world. It's it, that that's what makes a difference. It's not necessarily just becoming super smart and studying. You know that's important, but it's this this is other component. You know the the, the two together. Yeah. I mean, there have been plenty of super smart. Oh, we were referring Martin. earlier on to super smart, smart people who developed yes. the atomic bomb. Well, right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. So uh, uh, you know what it's called? It's called vision. Where there is no vision, the people perish. It's vision. Having an idea, having an, a, a vision, and vision me- meaning a coherent plan, a coherent idea, one that's going to work as a leader. Let's say. It's having that instead of just, you know, band aids. Uh, where yeah. does vision? Where does vision come from? Well, it comes from knowing your stuff. I, I, again, you can't fly an airplane as you learn how to do it. But vision comes from your inner self. That's where it comes from. Now, that doesn't mean that some that that someone's got to be meditating and doing whatever we think spiritually spiritual things are. You know what I'm saying? I think really good leaders are spiritual people because they have vision. They have vision by whatever means. They've, they've tuned in to their deeper self. They've tuned in to a deeper intelligence and a deeper, it's, it's kind of um, an innately moral sense. It's not the morality of rules and regulations. It's the morality of thinking in terms of a whole, thinking in terms of benefiting the whole rather than just grabbing for yourself. Yeah, in your book you said, um, we can begin to see that the, that morality emerges out of a whole identity. That intuitive yeah. mind is the inherently moral mind. When we lose that balance, we lose the moral center of ourselves. Yes, I, I think that's true. Yeah. You, know, you talk about, people study ethics today, or, and it's, it's just all... It's it kind of rules and regulations. It's awfully complicated. <laughs> no, <laughs> And there's a rule for every situation under the sun. Yeah. But really, it's got to come out of an innate sensing. Yeah, there's a, there's a phrase in spiritual literature, spontaneous right action. Um, oh. you, you, the, and it, I'm referring to the Gita again here. It says that, Krishna says, the, the intellect actually cannot grasp the complexities of karma, of all the ramifications of any action. It's far beyond our, our ability to compute. But if we, if we act... Well, as he puts it, um, established in yoga, perform action. If we establish, if we act from oneness or from wholeness, then without being able to compute all those ramifications, we act as though we, we were able to. And all the details are kind of worked out by cosmic intelligence. We're just sort of a little... Exactly. Exactly. So you're in alignment with this larger, this larger sort of resource and then that's that's going to flow out into this world in a way that is harmonious. Yeah. Yeah. 
the Tao Te Ching talks about that too, about how a society can, <clears throat> an individual or a society can be aligned with the Tao. And if it does so, then there won't need to be very many rules and regulations because people will spontaneously act exactly. you know, in the right way. Exactly. And I, I don't know if you have brought up kids, but... No, it, it, just dogs. Dust dogs. Well, bringing up children, it, 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 you, you, you can have a rule that lasts for about two weeks because in two weeks... <laughs> In two weeks, they've changed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you ha- it's like a kind of this and a that all the time, all uh, the time. Interesting. <laughs> well, that whole thing about, um, you know, morality and spine, I- I- I've helped to establish a thing called the Association for Spiritual Integrity, um, al- along, um, with, along with some spiritual teachers we've founded this organization, because there's been right. so much misbehavior in, in spiritual circles you know, various gurus and teachers acting badly. And, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, and students will sit there, you know, with a teacher going f- more and more off the rails and, and be thinking either because he's saying it or because they assume it, well, this guy is enlightened and it seems like what he's doing is crazy, but, hey, what do I know? I'm not enlightened, so I'll just kind of go along with this. And then oh. the whole community ends up getting dragged off into, a, you know, I mean, a uh, jo- Jonestown is the extreme example, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but there have been other ones. And so our hope in establishing this thing was to sort of enliven in the spiritual community a sense of what may or may not be appropriate uh, because we can't assume that any anyone who proclaims himself a spiritual teacher is necessarily impeccable in his behavior, and as a result of having attained the highest possible level of consciousness, so there, no, you know there are not too many Ram, Ramana Maharshis kicking around. Um, so I don't well, know. Well, by their by their fruits you shall know them. Exactly. Yeah. Huh. You know, they, you don't have to reach a high level. You just you, you need to act with inte- You know. Yeah. It's a, it's it's what you do, isn't it? Yeah. How you act, how you act with people, yeah. and, and 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 you know, and we are fallible too. I mean, we we're we're, we're learning all the time, so we we do make mistakes. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, that's I mean, that's a good example, isn't it, of where of what I was saying earlier that I sometimes think that there'll be just as many pitfalls when this idea of well, we're at our own source, you know, becomes more institutionalized if that's the right word maybe let's hope maybe it should never be institutionalized i don't know that'll be the because pitfall. There's, there's so many you the mind can take off on all of these things and yeah declare itself to be this that and the other there's a great story where god and the devil are walking along the road together and god reaches down picks something up and puts it in his pocket and the devil says hey what's that and god says oh it's just it's the truth and the devil says oh give it to me i'll organize it for you <laughs> I love that story. <laughs> that will, when you talk to Ian McGillchrist about the left and the right brain, uh-huh. that's very much like the left, that's very much sounds like the left brain doing that. Um, yeah, yeah. And the, the, the right brain has the truth in the sense of a larger vision. Uh-huh. But he'll, I mean, he'll talk to you about that better than I can. <laughs> a couple of questions have come in. Let's do another one. And uh, feel free to bring up anything. I don't want to be taking up all your time and not letting you say some other things you wanted to say. Oh, I've been enjoying the conversation. Okay, good. So this is, um, I'm not sure how she pronounces it. I, it looks like Annie, but it's A-I-N-N-E from Cape Town, South Africa. I have children. Sometimes I live in fear of them repeating painful mindsets I was prey to. Then I wish to direct them and control their negative behavior. It's kind of what we were talking about just now. At other times, I feel encouraged to try connected allowing, just trusting their innate wisdom and allowing them to essentially autocorrect when it can cause me to shake inside with fear or judgment. What is your understanding this, your guidance on this? I think that children um, have, well, the, the way I worked with my children was that I did fundamentally trust that, trust their being. I trusted their being and I tried not to override that most of the time children don't want to self-destruct you know if they're not reacting to some to some strange sort of they're not in some strange angry mode that they're trying to kind of you know take revenge on on you as a parent that they don't they don't want to do self-harm uh, and they want to be close to you and they want to they value that relationship you know so i i would tend to definitely veer on the side of trusting them 
trusting them with a little bit of uh, cor corrective you know inquiry and uh, here and there and whatever also whatever you as a parent can handle and are comfortable with you know you can't you can't override your own needs and your own um sense of what's right so in other words there there aren't any rules you 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 have to you have to sort of feel it out bit by bit rather like it sounds like you're doing but i i i, te I tend to say that being is in them and in in some ways it it hasn't been as squashed you know as it, it tends to as as we get older it, it's 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 strong and they're not frightened of the world and you wouldn't want them to be frightened of the world um children have less fear than we do usually about adventure and about new things actually the story of percival is very funny like that because the mother's terrified of him going off he 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 um she's her other sons were, were killed as knights and her husband died of something or other so she's kept percival in the wilderness not knowing anything about the court and the sophisticated world of the king you know the court and the knights and and so he's a simpleton. All he all he does all day is practice javelin throwing in the forest, and that's how his adventures begin. Because one day he's out in the forest, and he meets this is this. The other lovely thing about this story is quite comic. He's out in the forest, and he meets three knights, five knights, and of course they are dazzling to him because they've got this beautiful armor on and coloured ribbons on the horses, and he's never seen a knight in his life. And so he says, "What are you?" And they say, "Well, we're knights." He says, well, I'm, "I've never seen knights." And, so on and so forth. So they tell him about King Arthur and he just rushes back home and says to his mother, I want to become a knight. And she immediately faints. <laughs> <laughs> it's the very thing she's been trying to keep him from. Um, and he, but he has to go, you know, he has to go off on his quest. And so. Um, kind of reminds me of the story of the Buddha where his father, you know, it was prophesied that he would either be a great saint or or a great king, right? And so, you know, his father said, yeah, oh, I want him to be a king. So he sheltered him and tried to prevent him from seeing anything. But eventually Buddha got out and saw, you know, a sick person and an old person and a dead person. And, you know, he was he realized that the, all those things could happen and will happen to him eventually, too. Um, and... Uh, and yet then he that was the beginning of his grail quest, you know, to understand his true nature and, and um, eliminate suffering. Mm. Um, I was just thinking there. Um, that's gone. All right. might come I'll back. ask you another um, question and maybe it'll come, come back. back. All right. um, this is from Paul in Santa Cruz, uh, California, many people become spiritual seekers in order to find healing from their psychological suffering. Even upon reaching highly awakened states, they find that the relative issues of personal, mental, and emotional suffering remain, or in some cases become more pronounced. What counsel do you give these people? Does psychotherapy have a role to play here? Uh, well, I'm not really, I, I wouldn't say I'm really qualified to answer that fully. I, I don't know of people who've attained high i mean what do we mean by a high state of enlightenment anyway I, I i never quite know what we mean because i tend to believe that it's something quite ordinary rather like uh we've been, you know rick and i've been talking about that you it's just a rather gentle thing where you live your life in a mindful way con connecting to this sense of well-being and let that guide you rather than some sort of altered state you know, and I, I would tend to say that if you're, that if you do have, if someone does have great psychological difficulty, I'm not really sure that they are enlightened or I'm not really sure that they're aligned anyway in the way that we've been speaking about. Because the one thing I do know, I, I'm not a therapist, but I uh, worked with, I had some good friends who were colleagues and uh, we did workshops together using the Grail myth and uh they were psychotherapists, and they uh, they agreed that the the cycle of addiction that, that that I described earlier in the myth is actually. Let me just make this simpler. They agreed that the art of therapy was really to get someone to connect with their own self, to connect with their own authority and their own power in whatever way. You know, 
And if that hasn't happened, when that happens, it brings some form of healing and resolution. Because that is the end of, of mental, mental dis-ease. Now, are there, are there sort of severe conditions that are like schizophrenia or, or, or things which I have no knowledge of and I can't, I, can't, I can't speak about them? They're to do with chemical imbalances in the brain, it seems. Um, can, that, can that person be helped? I don't know. I, I, that's a puzzle. I, I, I don't know. I don't know what's going on there. You yeah, know. it's a good answer. It raises some interesting questions. I've had people argue with me that you can be an enlightened SOB or an enlightened alcoholic or one of these things. And, you know, I, I would always say, well, if that's enlightenment, you can have it. You know, I, I, I think we're, if we're going to use a term like that, we need to reserve it for something much more um, holistic, much more healthy. Um, and that if someone is behaving in those ways, then they're a work in progress. They may have made some mm -hmm. significant progress. They might be articulate, uh, eloquent, and charismatic, mm -hmm. um, but they've got a ways to go. Um, th that's my opinion, yeah. mm. <laughs> clearly. And um, it's it's a confusion. It's a source of confusion for people because there have been some famous teachers who've been real pieces of work you know? oh yeah well charisma yeah well yeah. that's the wounded king in operation because they feed off that energy yeah um, yeah hmm. yeah yeah but on the other hand you know it raises interesting questions like could you be a, what if in what if ramana had somehow come down with alzheimer's you know towards the end of his life is that possible and if he had would he still be self-realized or would the malfunctioning of the brain cause self-realization to somehow be lost? Um, is the consciousness, we know that consciousness is more than just a product of the brain, but the brain is like a transmitter receiver for consciousness. And if the transmitter receiver gets damaged enough, yeah. ca can we lose um, the realization of consciousness we may have acquired in life? Oh, well, actually that's, that's it. That's interesting because the thing is, I just it just made me realize we're all enlightened already at, at the level of the inner self. Yes, it's not a that. problem. It's not a problem. <laughs> we just don't so, realize it. Yeah, it, it, we, you don't have to. That inner self doesn't have to do any work really to be what we call enlightened. It's enlightened. It. The point is, is our person what I call our person? I use that phrase, personality self. Is it is it linked into that sufficiently to benefit? in terms of the way we think, the way we act towards others, the ideas we come up with, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so if the brain is damaged, which presumably schizophrenia must, might, might involve, sure. then that will, to some degree, impact that personality self. And it probably, we probably would be limited in the way we were going to express that. But at the other side of the veil... Was, there's no problem, and at some deep level of of an extremely autist, autistic person, there can be joy. You know, there, there there can be a sense of joy. They may have huge frustration in dealing with the realities of picking up a pencil or whatever it is, trying to write, and that will bring out frustration. But that's natural. I mean, children get frustrated in learning to grow because they fiercely want to grow. You know, they fiercely want that. They want their freedom. So, I don't. I don't think enlightenment is some sort of, you know, state where we'll just sort of float along serenely forever, <laughs> do we? <laughs>You know, you write a lot about multidimensionality. I don't know if you quite call it that, but about being able to live in two worlds simultaneously. Um, and, you know, the outer world is always going to be blooming, buzzing confusion in a way. There's always going to be a lot going on and challenges and, disease, yeah, yeah. you know, wars and diseases and all kinds of things. But by definition, enlightenment is a state in which the inner world has been realized, not just glimpsed, not intuited, not just sort of no. felt like it's down there somewhere, but actually we've shifted into that being our primary orientation, our primary yes. vantage point. It's a so and it's a it's a resource. It's a, I, I, I think of it as a resource that we it, it's practical. It's something we're using all the time. Sure, yeah. it has huge practical implications for yeah, one's life. 
And, uh, and one of its characteristics, traditionally, ha- is bliss, or ananda, you know, sat chit ananda. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, you know, traditionally, um, enlightened people are characterized as being blissful. You see the, the laughing Buddha, you know, and, and uh, all the various scriptures talk about the, 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 the bliss of that state and how, how intrinsically fulfilling it is. So it's a bit, to me, it's a bit of an oxymoron to say that one could be enlightened and yet suffering. Superficially, there may be suffering. I mean, when Ramana was dying of cancer, you know, people were all concerned about his suffering and about his dying and all. And, you know, he would make comments like, you know, you don't get it. This, this isn't touching me. <laughs> I'm not, you know, I'm not that which can suffer or can die and so on. Mm. Well, I, I um, yeah, there's, I mean, there's, I, I'm not a, re- a student of Buddhism at all. I just touched into a little bit of it. Uh, because Ra- I Ramana love, was I, more of a Hindu, an Advaita oh, yes, yes. guy. Yeah. Uh, well, the reason I talked about Buddhism is because it, there is something in there about life is suffering, isn't it? I'm not. I, oh, that's I, one of the main I principles. Think, yeah, life, yeah, life, life yeah. is suffering, and you yes. have to get out of it. And you have to get out of it. Um, I must say, I don't. I don't know how that evolved or who evolved that, but I don't feel that. I think joy is joy is the nature of your inner being. Joy and love, that's what it is. That's who we are. That's our, that's our frequency. That's our prime frequency, actually. So, I mean, laughing at things and having a sense of humor, you know, enjoying things. Uh, life, there's lots of things that's very enjoyable about life. <laughs> you know, uh, so, yeah, I agree. I think bliss, definitely. Well, you know, if you bite life, in... Life is blissful. I mean... I don't want to do the washing up all the time, but overall, I think life, I find life blissful. I, I, I think there's so much to appreciate. I think that might be one thing to do is to develop a habit of appreciating things, of just thinking about things that you can naturally feel appreciative of. Yeah. I like washing the dishes. It gives me an excuse to get my hands clean, and it gives me a chance to listen to stuff on my iPod. Yeah, but, well, there is that. <laughs> yeah, but you know this thing about life is suffering or bliss or whatever. Um, if you if you bite into an orange without having peeled it, you might say, "Ooh, oranges are really bitter, or bitter. you know, they're sour or something." Um, but the problem is you haven't peeled it. So you, you peel it and you get to the inner orange and you find, oh, oh oranges are actually sweet. I was, just, mm. I was just tasting the outer value of the orange. Mm. So that's an obvious metaphor here for what we're talking about. Yeah. No, indeed. And the, 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 bitter, the bitter parts of life and the difficult parts of life, um, are, you have more traction to work with them when when you're sort of living from the orange, as it were, <laughs> living from yeah. the sweetness uh, of the orange. Um, maybe some of this is also just to do with aging, getting older and wiser. It, m- it might be uh, a part of things. Um, one's always very much more impatient when one's younger, in one's 20s and 30s. I think it depends on how you live also. If you live well, then getting older does result in getting wiser. Um, yes, I mean, you can get more and more lost as you get old. You can. Because you can feel more and more disconnected from your inner self. One time, Abraham Lincoln was con- considering a, a cabinet post, uh, someone for a particular cabinet post, and he's, he rejected the guy, and he said, I, I don't like the way he looks. And someone said, how, how can someone help the way he looks? And Lincoln said, I consider everyone over the age of 40 to be responsible for the way he looks. <laughs> Is that where that quote comes from? That's what I heard, yeah. <laughs> I remember, yeah. Because you can see true. it in someone's face. You can. Yeah, it's etched in the face. But to quite a degree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, we've rambled on and uh, covered all kinds of points. Is, is there anything that you want me to just quickly show your books on the screen? You can oh, yes, tell, please. Yeah, that would so be let's great. see what we've got here. Um, here. I'll just do them in the order I put them up here. Or you, t- you tell me the order in which you want to. Uh, well, well, put up my first the the one I the the book I'm sort of trying to promote. Yeah, <laughs> is is the coherent self, coherent okay. world. I one. don't have the oh I do have the cover of that one. Yeah, here, you have here we cover. go. Yep, coherent self, coherent and world. It, it's got that nice picture of the vasicor on it with the with the faces that I really like. Um, sort of showing the different aspects of self, so, really. So, in a few sentences, what's this one about? 
Well, the subtitle is A New Synthesis of Myth, Metaphysics, and Bohm's Implicate Order. And so it's using the language of those three things, myth and metaphysics and Bohm's thinking, to explore the fact that if you are coherent as a self, and by coherent I mean inner and outer self are in relationship, then your world will be coherent. It will reflect that. Yeah. That's, uh, the world is as we are. The world is as we are. And yes. then what's the next book? Uh, well, which one is that? Is that King Arthur or is that the novel? Well, I can show you the King Arthur book if you want. Let's honestly. do the King Arthur book. The Return of King Arthur. The Return of King Arthur, uh, finishing the quest for wholeness. So that book takes the, the main events of the Arthurian legends and the Grail legend to talk about and uh, talks about what they mean in terms of the society and the individual and the the change from leadership being when we're not we can't wait for a hero or a heroine to come and save us uh, that's not going to happen the return of king arthur is to me is the collective return of just what we're talking about of, of enlightened individuals of people who are grounded in their spirituality and therefore allowing that coherent world to take place around them so that's what that's about, and it goes into huge depth um, about the about those myths, about what they mean, about the symbols, the sword, the broken sword, the chalice, the Grail Castle, the wasteland, the different characters, what they all mean, Merlin, um, Morgana, uh, um, uh, what was the one? What's his name? Percival. The one, it was Percival, and then the, the you know Lancelot. That's Lancelot, what. right? King Arthur, the Windy King. Um, and it goes into in depth that whole circuitry of how the wound and the wasteland, how that operates. And, and I look, because I knew a little bit more about the history of, of um, Romania and Ceausescu, and I, I, I look and talk about David Bohm there about what he said about identity, and I really go into depth. So it's, it's, uh, it, it was a lot of work that that book came out of 20 years. And I, I wrote the second book, The Coherent Self, really, because I just wanted to really make the point uh, even more clearly about the connection between consciousness and the world. So that, that's my nonfiction work. And then The Curve of the Land is the first novel. You've got that one there. And that is um, a story of people going on a tour of the ancient sites, the stone circles and dolmen of Western Britain. And the lead character has, she has a sort of shamanic um, experience where she kind of goes down into depth and connects to this, this energy. And then the, there's a poetry book there called Between Two Worlds. I've included that. That's a series of sonnets exploring these ideas in, in, in poetry. So, and of course, there's more on my website if people are interested. Um, dianadurham.net. Yeah. You can get to it. Yeah, I'll, I'll link to that from your page on, oh, uh, yeah, sure, on batgap.com. Yeah. Good. Well, thanks. It's been, yeah, well, been fun getting to know you and yes. getting to know your work and having this conversation. Likewise, yes. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Well, um, thanks. And uh, thanks to those who've been listening or watching. Um, Let's see. Next week, I'll be putting up an interview I did a few months ago with Scott Kilby as part of the Science and Non-Duality Conference. Uh, they had an online webinar thing. And then the following week, I'll be interviewing Ian McGilchrist, which, um, who, who uh, Diana is very familiar with. In fact, you've done some kind of a video about him, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, we made a film with him. Yes, yeah. we wanted to do a bigger project, but it didn't, it didn't work out. But uh, his book is absolutely amazing. Absolutely Great. Absolutely amazing. Well, I've got two weeks to read it. <laughs> <laughs> You'll need them. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks. Um, and again, thanks to those who've been listening or watching. Um, and we'll see you for the next one. Okay. Take care, Diana. Thanks. Thanks, Rick. Bye-bye.